can reach us through Facebook or through our uh, YouTube live channel and that uh, the lyrics will be uh, posted there shortly and I do apologize for that interruption and let's get uh, ready for worship amen I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but not alive all my failures I tried to hide it was my tomb till I met you you called my name and I ran out that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you call my name and I ran out that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day now my mercy has saved my soul now your freedom is all that I know the old made new Jesus when I met you you call my name and I ran out that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you call my name and i ran out that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day out of the darkness to your glorious name you call my name and I ran out that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day Calvary Chapel, Malibu family, friends. We're on one mic here, so I'm, I'm leaning on my brother here. Good, you got it. All right. Well, we just want to welcome you to Calvary Chapel, Malibu. We're here in the parking lot at Juan Cabrillo Elementary School, and you can see the beautiful picturesque ocean, the Pacific, right behind us. If you didn't know what Pacific means, it means peace. And so we are going to welcome the peace of the Lord that surpasses all understanding today. God's got a great message for you. I ask you to open your hearts, your minds to what he has for you. For all those out there in media line, please feel free to, uh, to go ahead and interact on our Facebook Live. And it's a great way to ask questions or to ask for prayer requests, whatever it may be. And so with that, we're going to open. We're going to jump in with another song of worship, and then we'll be back with a message. God bless. How many of you guys feel that you've been rescued in your life by Jesus? How many of you guys know that he has broken every chain that you've been experiencing in your life? The second part to the song said this. I needed rescue 
My sin was heavy, but your chains break the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I had no future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, I ran out that grave. Out of the darkness, into your glorious name. You call my name, and I ran out that grave. Out of the darkness. To your glorious day. How many are grateful to be here this morning? You know, I was um, I was with my daughter. I usually am in the mornings, and then in the evenings I go and take care of clients and so forth, um, or whatever I need to do to make a living. <laughs> but um. It was amazing because I was with my daughter and we have these steps that go down um, our townhouse area. And we were going down the steps and I was thinking about how when she was focused and her hand was holding mine and she was going down the steps and she's only two and about two months or one month. when she was focused going down the steps, she would go automatically like, like no tomorrow. She had just pace, momentum, and so forth. But as soon as she heard some noise from some, some neighbor and so forth, she looked to the side and she stumbled. And it made me realize how our life is. We are children of God. And when we don't hold dad's hand, we stumble. And we need him to build our life. And that's where this came. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of every praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your 
love to those around me. Show me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for building us with your hands. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken heavenly father thank you for this morning thank you for being with us lord for holding our hand and keeping us firm in your steady ways. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the adversity and the issues that come around us because you mold us. You put us in that fire to make us new, to make us whole. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation I would put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken On now? Good. See, he had the touch. All right. What would we do without the worship team? They're always up and going with the tech, right? All right. Great music. Um, excellent. Uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to our friends, our uh, it, what is kind of becoming a sister church in Kenya. I've been in dialogue with my friend out there that I met at the conference in Uganda last January. And he is wanting us to come out and do a conference in his area. He's sending me pictures of them doing church and, and so on. So there might be something there in 2021 where whoever would want to go out there to Africa. Uh, it might be a possibility. We'll see what happens with all the corona, corona craze, we'll call it. And uh, we'll see where to go from there. Um, but just really blessed of what they're doing. You want to? See, I mean, that was beautiful worship that we just had. But you want to see beautiful worship? You go to Africa, man. I'm telling you, they are just. There is such a life to it. It's incredible. Their world revolves around worship, and it's just. It's just a real. Um, just a real encouragement. You walk out of there going, man. I've just been born again, all over again. So, uh, so if any of you guys would ever be interested in doing something like that, uh, let me know. We'll talk about it. We'll see what happens over the next six months. So we are going to go ahead and jump right into the scriptures. Um, if you would go ahead and stand for the Word of God, we stand for the Word of God. We sit for the Word of the Teacher. We are in Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. 
As you know, we go systematically right through the scriptures. And so we're going to pick up in verse 46 of chapter 10. So when I see the Bibles stop opening, we will go ahead and, and, and read. You ready? All right. Let's go ahead and jump right in. So verse 46. Now they, that's Jesus and his disciples, came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he arose and he came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that is to say, Master, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask that you would open our heart to your word and your word to our heart. We pray, Lord God, that each person here that is in this parking lot or out there in media land would expect to receive something from the Lord, that, he would, that you would touch their heart, Lord God, in a manner that they have not been touched before, and it would cause a shift in their inside world to follow you clearly and concisely and to know that you are, in fact, the pearl of great price. We thank you. We praise you in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. And in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So the setting here is in Jericho. Anybody here been to Jericho? One person, I've been to Jericho. It's an amazing place. It's, it's, uh, it's just this intersection of the old and the new world. Let's see if we can put that there so things don't blow away. Uh, it, 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 during first century, it was considered a beautiful city. And, and the Herodians, they built it out and they called it the City of Roses. And so we see here that Jericho, a most exciting, bustling, first century city in Palestine. It was a great marketplace from the east and the north. As people would come through, they would trade and bargain and buy and sell in Jericho before they would do that last 17-mile ascent up into Jerusalem. And so it is considered by many, by many historians and archaeologists, to be the actual oldest city known to man. Isn't that something? The oldest, let me rephrase that, the oldest existing city, a city that is actually still a city, is considered to be, if not, the very oldest city that is still operating today. So as we know, it's the home to the Old Testament passage when, when the Israelites, led by Joshua and Caleb, they enter into the promised land, they cross the Jordan, and then there's Jericho, which at that time was a group of enemies, and, and so the Lord instructed them to go around the city seven times. At the end of seven times, they would do what? Do, 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 do. They would blow the horn and the walls would fall. And, and so from that point up to this point, it always had this place that God's dominance would be in this area. And so we see here that it says that now they, that's Jesus and his followers, they came to Jericho and there was a large crowd surrounding them. Many were making their way to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. It was a, it was a, a, a pilgrimage that everybody made during Passover to come and offer their sacrifices for their atonement. And it says that as Jesus went out of Jericho with the disciples, that a great multitude followed them. It was customary for distinguished rabbis to have a following with them. And while they were walking along the road, surrounded by others, the multitudes, they would be teaching along the way the things of the Lord. And so for our Lord, at this point, his earthly ministry will soon come to a close. His end is near. It's in this setting that Jesus will perform his very last recorded miracle in Mark. Now, we know that there are a few other miracles in a couple of the other Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, as well as the Gospel according to John. Uh, we know that Jesus cursed the fig tree, which was a picture of the Old Testament, the, the Old Covenant sort of passing away, and that a new one was ushering in. 
or we remember when they were in the Garden of Gethsemane and, and, and Peter lopped off the ear of the Roman soldier. Remember that? And Jesus touched it and healed it. So there were those. But in the, Mar in the Gospel according to Mark, this would be the last recorded miracle. And we see here that there's a man by the name of Bartimaeus. And it emphasizes that he was the son of Timaeus and that he was sat by the roadside begging. So his day must have started like any other. He wakes up, he pulls the dirt from his hair and shakes off the, shakes off the dust of his garment and he hopes for a crust of bread simply to eat something, to get something in his belly. To the people, because he was blind, he would have been considered cursed by God and, and some generational sin had caused his blindness. But so he makes his way to the city gate where he does each and every day. It's just another day in Jericho for this blind man, this blind Bartimaeus. And he sits there in the city and he listens as the city comes to life. So you have the, the donkeys in the corner going, hee haw, hee haw. And you have the children running around making noises. And you can hear the camel's hoofs starting to go like this. And so he can't see anything. He's in a world of darkness, but his ears are attuned to the surrounding region. He knows these sounds, they're very familiar to him. And he sits there in the city as it comes to life and it's just another day in Jericho. But he just so happened to be exactly where he needed to be for something that would change his life forever and for always. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. The Bible also says in the book of Psalms that today is the day of salvation. And so when we position ourselves in the way of the Lord, the Lord is always sure to meet our need. And so uh, I want to say that as blind Bartimaeus is about to receive the greatest miracle a person could receive, that he is about to experience something that not only would heal his sight, but he would have an encounter with the living God made flesh that when the need was made known, Jesus stood still. He stopped everything to address the need of this blind Bartimaeus, this poor beggar in the streets. So this morning's title today is, is And Jesus Stood Still. And we're going to break this down into two parts. First, the cry for mercy, and the second, the call to mercy. So the first is the cry for mercy. Verse 47, the cry for mercy begins with what? A desperate awareness. It says in 47, the first part, it says that when he, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. So he hears the donkeys, he hears the children, he hears the camel's hooves, but now he hears something even greater. He hears this bustle and going, hey, there's that Jesus guy. Hey, there's that Jesus of Nazareth. He's the one that the Pharisees want to kill. He's the one that the Sanhedrin keeps coming down. But that guy has done some things that we've never seen before. This rabbi... Man, he's got the gift, he's got the anointing. And so this starts to spark to life, blind Bartimaeus. He's interested, he wants to know what is happening. How do I get access to this Jesus? When blind Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus, he knew that Jesus was his only hope. How many of us today know that Jesus is our only hope? Social programs aren't our hope. Government is not our hope. Even our family is not our hope. The only hope that we can truly have that is a hope that is lasting and will perform a miracle such we see here in this passage is Jesus, Jesus only. He's the only one. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but through him. And so this man, this blind Bartimaeus who sat by the highway side begging, he probably stenched of the, of the dirt of the street. He had no shame when it came to seeking the recovery of his sight. He knew what his need was, and he wasn't going to let anybody get in the way of getting that need met. He knew he was blind. He was in perpetual darkness from his mother's womb directly into what we know as the known world. All he knew was darkness. And so I ask today, how many today may see with their physical eyes, but spiritually they are walking in darkness. They're blind. They're spiritually dead. The world winks at sin, does it not? Today we want to rename sin for something other than what it really is. But I want to encourage you, 
congregation. I want to encourage you out there in media land that the sin which God called as sin in the beginning of the scriptures is the same sin today and there's nothing new under the sun. We're not more sophisticated. We're not more righteous. We're not more amazing than we were uh, 2,000 years ago. If you think that we, well, you know what, because I've heard these conversations. I've heard it simply in the greatest classrooms that you could be at. I sat in a Yale class and, you know, when I was looking to possibly go to school at Yale and I was looking, it was, I was in this divinity class and I watched them try to redefine the sin of, of same-sex marriage. I'm going, that's not true. And this other guy goes, I don't think that's Paul's first century interpretation. They started to push back against this. And I'm going, you know what? It's the same sin as it was then as it is today. They started to reinterpret it. And it's just unbelievable how we think that there's something new under the sun. And, and the pushback is, well, you know, uh, back then they weren't sophisticated. Today we have been enlightened with education. We have been enlightened with, with a modernization of the world. I'm going, okay, yeah, we have had some of that. But let me ask you a question. When Corona-19 first came out, what did you see in our culture? You saw this craze of people going to Costco and every grocery store you could possibly imagine and ramping up with toilet paper, ramping up with paper towels, ramping up with water, ramping up with everything that they get at the expense of somebody else not getting theirs. That is our primal nature. And I promise you, the Lord is my witness, that if something were to get, to get too tough, I promise you your sophistication of your modern education cannot save you, nor will it restrain you from becoming an animal. I know it. I see it. I, the only people that will not be able, that will restrain are those that are walking in the coolness of the Lord. Each and every one of you have a beast inside you. I know because I preach every Sunday and I see it. I'm just kidding. You're a beautiful people. It's those people in media land. But the reality of it is all it takes is a little bit of pressure and you watch what will happen in society. No longer they're sophisticated. Those with the, the greatest degrees and the highest places of learning, all of a sudden they'll be the greatest beasts and the greatest animals because they'll be hungering with that greatest sense of entitlement going after what they want and what they need. There's nothing new under the sun, friends. It's all been written in the scriptures from the beginning until today. And the sins that God named as being a sin then are the same sins that will cause you to be separated from your holy God even still today. It says in the book of Isaiah 59, 9-10, So justice is far from us, and righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in deep shadows. Like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like men without eyes. At midday we stumble as if we were in twilight. Among the strong, we are like dead. Look what, look what the Apostle Paul writes to 1 Timothy. This is such an interesting little scripture. It says in 1 Timothy 5, 6, it says, But they who live in pleasure are dead while they live. Wow. But they who live for pleasure are dead while they live. Now, can anybody identify with that? I know I can. There's been seasons where I've just, you know, I've just been a glutton for, oh my goodness, give me more food or give me more this or give me more Netflix. Blah, 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 give me more, you know, and all of a sudden your spirit starts to just sort of go to this downward spiral and then all of a sudden you're not a very happy camper, are you? Or maybe it was back in the season when I was swinging from the chandeliers and, you know, with beer bongs and kegs and all that kind of stuff in, the, in my fraternity days, you know. I was dead while I lived. I thought I was having fun, but it wasn't prosperous in any such manner. Many of us have been through that arena where many of that could have led to greater addictions and have caused our lives to sort of unwound. We're walking around alive, but our spirit is dead. I can definitely identify with that, and I know that most of us can identify with that as well. And so the cry for mercy begins with the desperate awareness. We must know our need. And, so, and then it leads to 47b, the cry for mercy has a clarity of insight. It says that, it says that he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So he cries out, Jesus, son of David, a blatant messianic title. Everybody would have recognized this. So all of a sudden, this blind man, when everybody else sees him as Jesus of Nazareth, just this guy Jesus has some, some special gifts, nuh-uh. 
not blind Bartimaeus. He recognized him for exactly who he was. Not some great teacher, not some great prophet, nothing other than who Jesus really is, the Son of God, the Messiah who was to come that was prophesied thousands of years prior. He says, you are the Messiah, Son of David. This means that blind Bartimaeus was seeking Jesus as his hope. He was seeking Jesus as his deliverer. He was seeking Jesus as his leader, but most importantly, he was seeking Jesus as, are you ready for this? His Lord and his Savior, not just the deliverer from his blindness. He calls him the Messiah. He knows that the Messiah would come to save his from his sins. So even though he was physically blind, he had more spiritual light in sight than most people surrounding him, riding the donkeys and the camels and the bustling marketplace of Jericho of the day. So he cries not just for the son of David, but he takes it even a step further. He cries for mercy. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we do not deserve, but mercy is not getting what we deserve. Now, when I was swinging from those chandeliers and doing everything else under the sun, I am so grateful to God that he has protected me from the full consequences of my actions in the past. Let me say that again. Are you not grateful that God has protected you, even if you weren't calling out to God, that God has protected you from the full consequences of your past? If that's you, raise your hand. That's definitely me. That's a yes and amen. Because you know what? I too, just like you, I was an animal you know I know what you were going through I know what you were doing some of you still are animals but we won't talk about that I'm just kidding you know so he's I love this so he cries out for mercy to not get what he deserves he doesn't cry out for anything else just mercy he was blind he was a beggar yet he didn't cry out for a house he didn't cry out for food he didn't cry out for clothing he cried for his most basic need which is a need that only he could see with spiritual eyes and that was mercy that's it that's all we cried out for we say that we are sorry for our sins but we're sorry actually that we got caught we need mercy it's more than just being sorry for getting caught we need to be sorry with a godly sorrow it's the difference between a godly sorrow and a worldly sorrow. A godly sorrow is that we have transgressed and sinned against a holy God, but a worldly sorrow, we're just sorry that we got caught. Look what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7. He writes to the church of Corinth, which was a huge, I mean, this, this community was just the heathen of the heathen surrounding the church. And so there was many righteous people within the church, but the world was starting to creep into the church, and so they had a lot of conflict in this church. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and there is no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. What happens when we're sorry that we got caught? It's just a matter of time till we do it again because there's no change in our fundamental nature. But when we have a godly sorrow that takes us to a change in our fundamental nature, then, then, we, then all of a sudden, when that, when that opportunity to sin again, there's a flag that goes up. There's an alarm that goes, beep, 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 stop. We don't go in that direction anymore. If you're sorry for just getting caught, well, then, well, you know what? I just need to be a little smarter next time and not get caught. A godly sorrow brings us to a place to, to repent that is not to be repented of, which leads to life and it leads to salvation. And then thirdly, the cry for mercy continues with a passionate persistence. In verse 48, it says, Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more. Don't you love that? Many warned him, say, hey, blind Bartimaeus, shut up. Not only are you yelling and you're distracting everybody, you're calling this guy the Messiah. How do you know he's the Messiah? Because he may have been physically blind, but he had spiritual eyes that could see far beyond what anybody else could see. The cry for mercy continues with passionate persistence. And the man, even though they said, you got to be quiet, he cried out, it says, all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. The man will not quit. He will keep going after Jesus no matter what. He will not quit 
five minutes before the miracle. He will not quit one minute before the miracle. He will keep going after that miracle until that miracle manifests. In fact, everything that he does to go after the miracle is a preparation in his heart for the miracle so that when it comes, he's readily able to receive it and not implode. Persistence is a byproduct of desperation. And this man, in fact, had the gift of desperation. You want to stay motivated on something, on a new track? You find me a desperate man, I'll find you a person that's willing to sell it all and buy the pearl of great price. So many of you know that now I'm, I'm a chaplain for the United States Navy. And, and so I'm in there, I got, you know, it's really kind of neat. I'm in the uniform and all that kind of stuff. It's really a whole nother world. It's very exciting. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. Uh, it's, it's just a very interesting world. Um, it is a proven fact that if you give too much to government, they'll mess it up. I'm just saying that. Even though we're the greatest Navy in the world, still, when it comes down to the lower echelons of administration and this and that, no, 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 no. It does not operate on a level that operates out there. Uh, I hope nobody in the Navy is watching this. But the point of it is, is everybody would admit that, that on the administration level, it can be a little messy. You know, you don't give things to government that you don't have to give to government. Hence, I'm a small government guy. You all know that. But nevertheless, uh, I, I digress. So we see here, uh, so in the Navy, I'm with these guys, I'm with these young guys, and every single time I walked into a new area, whether it was medical, whether it was a, a, an encampment, or whatever it may be, because there's all sorts of exercises happening out there, I'm telling you, every single person not only had great respect for the role of a chaplain, but they wanted to hear, man. They wanted to know what was it, that, why do you believe what you believe? Tell me about it. In fact, I'm told by others that in the Army, and in the Marines is the greatest opportunities to share the gospel. One chaplain told me, he was a pastor for five years, he said, I have never had so many opportunities to share the gospel as I have had in this environment of being a Navy chaplain. He's like, there's something about these guys that when they are going out to, when they're going into harm's way, they're desperate. They've been given the gift of desperation. Currently, I'm, I'm going through, a, I'm kind of a documentary nerd and I'm going through The War by Ken Burns. Anybody ever see The War by Ken Burns? I'm the only one? Only one? That one, yeah? What are you guys all looking at? <laughs> Never mind the media land. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an advertisement. Ken Burns, what's so amazing when you look at what I'm, so right now we just went through D-Day and all of that and June 6, 1944, but I kid you not, every time before there's another planned invasion or an assault on another city, Ken Burns manifests this place where he shows the chaplains leading the men into a place of prayer and communion. It's unbelievable. Over and over and over again, there is a spiritual emphasis to what the men were doing before they were about to go ashore. And why? Because their lives were in the balance. How many of us don't know that our lives are in the balance because, you know, we have a full bank account and we have full, we have full bellies. But the reality of it is that each and every one of us are just, are just one accident away from a disaster. Just one. But what's more importantly is that where is our soul? Do we see our need? These young men and women, they see their need for something greater because they don't know what's going to happen to them next. And it's just been a great delight that they, in fact, have that gift of desperation. It says there in verse 48 that many warned him to be quiet and he wouldn't be quiet. The worldly voices will always rear their, rear their head and come against us, trying to tell us to be quiet. Hey, pastor, tone it down a little bit on the sin. Don't you know that you're not supposed to preach about sin if you want your church to grow? Well, tell you something. I got a great gift as a preacher. I'm telling you, my gift is to preach this church down to a manageable size. And that's what we have right here. Because any more than that, man, I don't know what I would do with it. That's my greatest gift here. And so with that saying, we see the worldly voices rear up trying to quiet him. Hey, blind Bartimaeus, what are you doing? What are you doing? Shut it. Shut your mouth. And sure enough, even those that love us most can distract us. But he won't be distracted. It says that he cried out all the more. Now, many of you that have been around for a while, you know that I like to invoke a little Greek. And so I'm going to ask you this question. Can anybody tell me what the word all means in Greek? It means all. 
It means all. I mean, that means everything. It's not that profound or deep. He cried out all the more. It means you're going to challenge me. You're going to try to shut me up. You're going to see something even greater because that tells me that the enemy is trying to come against me to get what I need. Not just physical sight. I need salvation. I need to have the Spirit of the Lord quicken me to a place that I can keep my eyes on Jesus all the days of my life. I want to spend eternity with my Lord, my Savior, thou son of David, my hope, my deliverer, my leader, my Lord, my Savior. Have mercy on me. He would not let the healing mercies escape him. So Jesus tests the man's faith to see how desperate he really is. He doesn't answer at first. But then he pauses. The persistence that this man has sharpens, increases, and grows his faith. It sharpens our need and awakens our mind when we have to keep coming after the Lord. Persistence teaches us to pray and to seek God for help and not to rest on man. Persistence teaches us to worship God, to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift us up. It is, in fact... The persistence that God gives us at the heart of the gift of desperation is a preparation for the miracle to come. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call unto me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. Matthew 6, 33. Can anybody quote it? How many things? Just a few? All. Oh for the media world, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all, capital A, capital L, capital L, all these things will be added onto you. This means that whatever you need to walk it out with Christ will be given you and not only just enough, but more than enough in abundance. Jesus would go on to say, ask and it shall be given you, knock and it shall be opened, seek and you will find. So it's not just ask once it's asking keep on asking and keep on asking and keep on asking seek and keep on seeking and keep on seeking and keep on seeking you knock and you keep on knocking and you keep on knocking and you keep on knocking and something happens in your inside world when you go after the lord with all of your heart soul body and mind when no half measures here friend you jump in with all of it something in your inside world starts to transform into the image of God. God takes that gift of desperation and he redeems it with a picture of salvation. And that leads to the miracle, the call to mercy. In 49 and 50, we see that Jesus stops everything when he calls us to mercy. It says in verse 49 that Jesus stood still. The crowd must have been huge, and Jesus stops in the midst of this crowd. How amazing. He stops without any hesitation. Now, you, many of you know, all of you know, pretty much here, but in Media Land, if you tune in for the first time, my, my beautiful wife and I have an amazing three-year-old child. But I can attest that, th- that this child has a nature that needs to be transformed. He can be very demanding, and he, he, and, but he is the, the apple of our eye. But we have an exercise in our home, both my wife and I, that when he calls out to us, even if it's a hundred times a day, we answer him. We answer him. He can go, Papa, why? Papa, why? Because this. We answer him. And what we want to ingrain into him is that God the Father will always answer you. He will never wear out, even though I may wear out. He will never wear out. He calls him. And at this point, Jesus stops everything, just as a parent stops everything when the need of that child is being expressed. Jesus commanded him, said, bring that man to me. He commands him to be sent. And they send for the man because he couldn't reach him. There was too many people. Now, can you only imagine that the people start to swell around knowing that Jesus of Nazareth, this man, has a reputation for actually doing these miracles. I'm sure that some were even sitting there going, oh my goodness, guess what's going to happen? This guy, Jesus of Nazareth, being a great rabbi, he's going to rebuke blind Bartimaeus for actually calling him the Messiah, the son of David. How dare he call him the Messiah, the son of David? Who knows what's going through their heads, but a lot of things are happening at this time. And so he's about to, so he calls him over, he brings him to him, because Jesus never turns a person away when they cry out to him. It's remarkable. It says here in this passage that when they went and grabbed blind Bartimaeus, what did he do? 
it says that he threw off his coat and he came to Jesus. It says that he threw aside his garment, he rose, and he came to Jesus. In other words, metaphorically speaking, he cast off all his impediments. He cast off all of his failures. He cast off all of his shortcomings. He cast off all of those things that had been holding him down for years spiritually, like an old garment, he threw it away. He cast it off. And so the essential message there is, let the one who steals, steal no more. Jesus would say in Matthew 11, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In Hebrews 12, 1, the, the author says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance or persistence the race marked out for us. Hebrews 12, 1. Wow. Jesus stops everything when this man, out of the gift of desperation, calls on the Lord, not just as Jesus of Nazareth, the great teacher, rabbi, but as the son of David, the Messiah, the one who is and was and is to come. You see, Jesus meets the need when, we, when he calls us to this healing mercy. Blind Bartimaeus knew exactly what he needed. He needed to see. We need to see spiritually. Blind Bartimaeus needed personal confession. We bear fruit in accordance to repentance. Blind Bartimaeus needed to confess his faith in Jesus. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Blind Bartimaeus led with calling Jesus Rabboni, Master. Our Father who art in heaven is the prayer that Christ taught us to pray, giving first and foremost all reverence to the one who is in heaven. A specific request received a specific answer. He says, go your way, your faith has made you well, or in the King James Version, your faith has made you whole. But what's interesting about that? Do you know what the word in the Greek is used for whole here? It's sozo. And the word sozo, every other time in the New Testament, is used to describe salvation. He says, not only do you now have eyes to see, but your soul has been saved. I saved your soul, but I also touched your eyes. He was made whole, not only whole physically, but whole spiritually, emotionally, and psychologically. Look at the gratitude that follows this man's salvation. It says that immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Now, we see that immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. But friends, I want to say this. I believe that this man was seeking the Messiah and salvation for all his life. Because God had used this place to that when the Messiah came, he actually recognized who he was. And I've said this often before, that in the church today, not our church, but in the church of America, many people become a part of the church because it's a great community, isn't it? It's a lovely community. We have great people in the church and people just, you know, people network and come together. It's wonderful. But who would actually recognize Jesus if he were walking through here today and he wasn't dressed like you or I? How many would? And I would say not those that are just a part of the church community, but those who had been seeking Jesus for years and years would recognize him at that point. The Bible says that my sheep hear my voice. And I want to say this. If you've been seeking truth, if you've been seeking God in whatever capacity, maybe it's not the defined God like you and I know as Jesus Christ, but you've been seeking with all of your heart. I'm telling you today, he's been leading you to this point to recognize Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as the Messiah, the one who is and was and is to come. To recognize him as the one who will not only heal your physicality, but will also make you whole spiritually, emotionally, and psychologically. He is the one that can do it. And so let us, as it says in Hebrews 12 too, let us fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. An incredible passage in a picture. I can see blind Bartimaeus today. 
years ago when I was in Jericho and we, we, um, we were with a small group and we were going through and you look at it and now it's just a tourist spot. It's just a tourist spot. But today, you know, back then, today it's, it's a tourist spot, but back then it was a hustling, bustling city of a, of a portal that all of these people would come from the north, from the east, and from the south, and it was a segue where they would go through this city to get to the holy city, Jerusalem. And could you imagine that at this point, all the onlookers saw that, oh my goodness, look what just happened. We've seen Bartimaeus since we were kids. Remember, we used to, 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 to steal his change, and we used to, you know, we used to throw rocks at him and this and that. All of a sudden, everybody just could see that this man was touched by God, not just physically, but his internal life, his inside world, would never be the same again. Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatsoever thing is true, whatsoever thing is noble, whatsoever thing is right, whatsoever thing is pure, whatsoever thing is lovely, whatsoever thing is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace shall be with you. We're going to have a song of worship, and I, I forgot, I'm being reminded, uh, I forgot to pray for our tithes and offerings today. So uh, I'm, I'm, there's just three of us up here today. So as you know, we have an agape box. For those online, as you probably already know, we do do tithes and offerings online through, uh, um, through, you can go to Calvary Chapel Malibu, donate. You can go to, you can send a check to P.O. Box 6341 Malibu, California, 90265. Um, and I think there's a text on there too that you can text here in our agape box. So we don't pass an offering bag. As you know, we, you know, whatever we do here, it's because of what you all do, what you give. So we're just very grateful for those that want to partner with us to get the message out to get Malibu and the surrounding areas. So with that, let us pray for our tithes and offerings and we'll have a song of worship. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that you own the cattle on a thousand hills. And so, Lord Jesus, we know that you are in control of all things. And so we just pray, Lord Jesus, for those that want to partner with Calvary Chapel Malibu. We thank you, Lord, for all the generosity, whether it's, whether it's financial or whether it's spiritual, whether whatever it may be. We thank you for all those that have committed their time, treasures, and talents to help Calvary Chapel Malibu reach the lost and dying in this world, starting here in our Jerusalem, which is the city of Malibu, extending out to Los Angeles and the uttermost parts of the world. We thank you and we praise you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And in Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Let's have a song of worship. Thank you for being with us today. Like I was um, telling you guys earlier, I was thinking about my daughter. Just God holding our hands always and me holding hers and just having that walk of just not seeing what's around us, not seeing the negative or anything like that, but just staying positive in God's word, God's presence. He's a good, good father because of that. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am it's who I am oh, I've seen many searching for answers far and wide but I know we're all searching for answers, only you provide. 
provide because you know what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. Who I am, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am, because you're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am who I am, it's who I am. When we cry out for Jesus as our Lord and Savior, as the Son of David, as the Messiah who always was and is and is to come, we get a picture in our inside world of the Messianic kingdom that God is going to set up a new heaven and a new earth. And the book of Isaiah foreshadows that new heavens and a new earth. In chapter 5, it says that the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Perhaps you are walking in a desert today, and the Bible says that when you get a hold of Jesus, not just as your deliverer, but as your Lord and your Savior, he will blossom your wilderness as, as the roses in the desert. He says that he will blossom as the rose. And it says that it shall blossom, not just blossom, but it will blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. He says, strengthen your hands and confirm your feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong. Be strong and do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance and he will recompense. He will come and he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The lame man shall leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. And he says, and a highway shall be there and a way and it shall be called the way of holiness. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go there. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with heads, and they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow, and sighing shall flee away, never to be seen again. So with that, I'm going to ask you to bow your head and pray this prayer with me that we can get a glimpse of that heavenly new heavens and new earth, that we can get a glimpse of heaven this side of heaven. Would you join with me in prayer and just repeat after me? Father, in Jesus' name, we acknowledge you as the Son of David, the Messiah that has come, and who will come again. Open the eyes of my heart. Quicken my spirit. And cause me to follow you. All the days of my life. In the name of the Father. And of the Son. And of the Holy Spirit. And in Jesus name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you this week. May the Lord's face shine upon you and smile upon you and give you the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. In Jesus' name, go in peace.
Love you all. Love you all in media land, and we'll see you real soon. Oh, this love so undeniable. I, I can hardly speak peace so unexplainable. I, I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me. Deeper still as you call me, deeper still into love, love, love. Because you're perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways to us. Because you're perfect in all of your ways Because you're perfect in all of your ways Because you're perfect in all of your ways To us You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who 